Well, thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm glad to see a reasonable audience here. I have to say that incest brings more people in off the street. Um, <laughs> The one I gave, the one I gave uh, the last time I was here. Um, but I think you may find some fairly hair-raising stuff, uh, even when I'm talking about snails. There's a, there's a, this is a, um, this book is still on sale. I'm glad to say this is one of my books, um, which is uh, it's a slightly, uh, it's not one of my best books possibly, but it's got a good title. It's called the Single Helix, and I decided to call it the Single Helix after probably the best known popular science book after after the selfish gene, needless to say, which is Jim Watson's book, The Double Helix. And I thought, well, I, don't, I, I know that the book is, my book is, isn't half as good as Jim Watson's book, but, <laughs> but if it sells half as many copies, I'll be very happy indeed. <laughs> but it didn't. Um, but even so, that's the single helix. And on, on, the, uh, on the screen there is a picture of the snail which I work on, whose Latin name was Helix, it then changed, it's now gone back to being called Helix, um, but that's the snail I work on, and you might, I'll try to explain to you why I actually um, do that. I've, 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 uh, I was once asked, people often wonder what, why people, why uh, scientists, biologists work on snails. There are many reasons, we've just heard about Bulinus and Bulimulus, they're actually vectors of of uh, tropical diseases, freshwater tropical diseases, schizosomiasis. Um, this one is I work on because it's very beautiful, but really. But there are good reasons for working on them. But I was once at a dinner party where talking, some people always ask, insist on asking, do I eat them? And uh, I say, I know what they eat, um, so I don't eat them. Um, <clears throat> And somebody out of the blue, there are several Greek people at the dinner party, and somebody out of the blue asked me, well, what do you call somebody who works on snails? And I said, oh, it's a malacologist. And to my great surprise, the Greek section of the audience fell rolling to the ground in laughter because the root of the word malacologist is the Greek malaka, which means soft and floppy, and is something very rude in Greek. Um, <laughs> So uh, you, I learned something at that dinner party, okay? Um, but there are, in fact, a number of surprising ties between the world of malacology, or conchology, which is the, which is the uh, study of shells, and the world of art, and also the world of science. And I hope I'll manage to suggest to you that they do overlap from each other. And that overlap's been around for a long time. This is Erasmus Darwin's, Darwin's grandfather, his book plate, Everything from Shells, a Conchis Omnia. And that was actually uh, painted on the side of his carriage, and he collected he collected snails and became famous as a result. But the good general rule is that plenty of people collect snails and don't become famous. In fact, there's an even better rule that if they stop collecting snails, then they become famous. Um, here's an example of just that. This is a book published in the 1800s um, called The Conchologist's First Book. And the conchologist is somebody who studies snails' shells rather than the soft and floppy bits of them. And uh, there it is, a handsome cover. Um, a conchologist's first book, a system, testaceous malacology, schools, shells by, guess who? Edgar Allan Poe. That was Edgar Allan Poe's first book. And there he is. Uh, I'm not sure what, what actually became of him. Um, there's another one, and several of them, but just mentioned another one, this chap here who is, of course, Lewis Carroll. And he was an amateur naturalist, as many people were in those days, an amateur snail collector. Um, and, of course, he's famous for his uh, poems, a poem, The Jabberwock, Jabberwocky. Beware the Jabberwock and so on. Beware the Jubjub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. Well, I don't know what a Jabberwock is, and I'm by no means clear what a Jubjub bird is, but I discovered to my surprise a few years ago what the bandersnatch was because here we have a German bandersnatch. This is a paper about my snail, uh, the polymorphism, polymorphismus by the Banderschnecken. So a Banderschneck is a banded snail. So that is the origin of the bandersnatch. And as soon as, uh, as um, uh, uh, Lewis Carroll had given up working on snails, he too became famous. Okay. Um, so there are many, many images of snails in the visual arts. Some of them are direct and literal. There's the gargoyles on the, on the Barcelona Cathedral, the Sagrada Familia, uh, beautiful snails carved there, as you can see, Gaudi. Um, some of them are rather more uh, figurative, but still give you a literal account of a snail. There, of course, is Matisse and his famous, uh, his famous uh, uh, paper cutout of a snail, um, but actually, and some of them are simply, uh, are simply decorative. If you go into medieval manuscripts, you find again and again these rather um, pretty 
uh, uh, images of snails, and there are lots of them. There are probably dozens or hundreds of them. Uh, I'm not quite... Nobody really knows why, but there's lots of them there, OK? And they're all very pretty. But some of them, and that's what I want to explore, some of these snail images have a deeper message. Um, so they, they really talk about sex, age, and death. And as a biologist, as an evolutionist, as a geneticist, that's what my job is, to make sex, in particular, boring. But by doing that, perhaps to understand a little bit about age and about death. And so as it turned out, and snail images uh, tell us something about all those things. Um, sex, of course, uh, the world of malacology, appropriately enough, is filled with that. Here we have Dali, who called himself the great masturbator. Um, and here's a Dali's woman with snail, and you can see it's clearly an image of impotence. Uh, Dali should be really called the great malacologist, maybe. Um, and he obviously knew what the root of the word was. So that's Dali, woman with snail, impotence and snails because they're soft and floppy. However, there are some slightly more surprising sexual or asexual references in the snail world. Here's an Annunciation of Francesco del Cossa, and you can see there's the Virgin Mary, and about to be her Annunciation as being a virgin, as being from a virgin, and across the bottom, perhaps you can see, is crawling this unlikely creature, a snail. Okay, so what the hell is that doing there? And the answer is that uh, the, uh, there is a text that says, if the dew of the clear air can make the snail pregnant, then God in virtue can make his mother pregnant, Jesus' his mother pregnant. Uh, and the reason that people thought that snails could get pregnant um, without having sex was that they had shells. Uh, and obviously you couldn't penetrate the shell, so they must be doing it in some other way. They were a statement, in some senses, of purity. Well, I have to say that's uh, far from correct, because snails are, are really uh, uh, about as... Uh, as um, far from purity, insofar as that's got any biological meaning, as it's possible to imagine. Many snails, not all of them, but many snails are in fact hermaphrodites. And here we have a Bernini, a sleeping hermaphrodite, um, and here we have both simultaneously male and female. But of course, um, uh, the her hermaphrodites was the child of Hermes and Aphrodite, and what he did was make the mistake of embracing a water nymph, um, and she managed to absorb herself into him, ending up with this slightly odd individual here. Well, all snails, well, all the ones I work on at least, are hermaphrodites, and simultaneously male and female. Boy girl meets girl boy, okay? They're actually cross-fertilizing hermaphrodites, and that's rather unusual, because what it means is that uh, the male part fertilizes the female part of the, of the, of the, uh, of the uh, opposite number, and vice versa, okay? Now, there is some rather interesting um, negotiations that go on, if you're a hermaphrodite and you're mating, uh, what you want to do is to be the boy. Obviously, you want to be the boy because that's much easier. You don't have to pay the school fees and that kind of stuff. Um, so hermaphrodites often mate for a long time and go in for all kinds of tricks to persuade or force the female part of the partner to uh, function and stop um, the, male, the male part of the partner from fertilising the, uh, the, uh, the other individual. And this is... Uh, an image of that. Here we have another one of these slightly irritating medieval snail paintings, uh, snail uh, drawings. Um, and you can see what we've got is an archer firing, for no obvious reason, an arrow at a rabbit. And strangely enough, snails do exactly that. I slightly wonder whether the uh, person who, who drew this actually knew that, because snails have what used to be called a love dart. And a love dart... Um, is, uh, is, is, of course, a, a common image in art. Um, there's a Boucher, Cupid, wounding Psyche, and that, of course, is the arrow which is inserting, being inserted into Psyche and forcing her, persuading her to fall in love with Cupid. This is a pretty image, um, and snails do exactly the same thing. Now, that arrow, I suppose, in human terms, comes up to about there, okay, up to your knee. Uh, here's a snail love dart. It's, um, 
It's about in human terms, if you were a snail, that would be up to about there. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty impressive looking um, object. And it used to be called a love dart, and the idea was somehow in an unformulated way. Uh, and you can see them if you put two snails together in the right season of the year, they will try and mate with each other, and in the morning you will see um, two or three of these darts scattered about perhaps on the bottom of the plastic box they're in. And there was this sort of feeling it was Cupid and Psyche and all rather romantic and that they held themselves together with it. That's not true at all. It's a classic case of male manipulation because what happens is in snails and in many other creatures which are hermaphrodites and not just hermaphrodites is that females have the ability to store sperm. They have special organs in their reproductive tract, which can, if they're mated with, they can accept sperm from a male and store it there. And if they find a better male, they'll use that male sperm. If they don't find, if they don't find a better male, they use the first male sperm. Um, and uh, we know a lot about this. And it turns out that actually that dart, when it's fired into the, into the individual that's acting as a female, contains a hormone which forces the female to use the um, th that male's sperm. So it's a kind of anti-contraceptive, it's a fertility hormone for male advantage, about as far as you can get from, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Cupid and Psyche. But things go beyond that, both in the art world and in the malacological world, because if you want to see genuinely bizarre behaviour, take a look at these slugs, okay? Boy, girl meets girl, boy. And slugs too, mate, um, and uh, you may see, I've seen them quite often. If you see them early in the spring morning, on a damp morning, you'll see them often hanging from a tree and spinning from a, a metre-long uh, rope of mucus and spinning back and forth and sort of wriggling with these large white objects. Uh, they're the penises, OK? And what they do is they hit each other with their penises uh, in order to try and persuade one to be the female. And we did, um, we did some work on this once. And this can go on for 12 hours. You know, it's a long, difficult job being a boy girl or a girl boy. Um, and we did some work on this one, and we were surprised to find some slugs didn't have a penis. Uh, and that was because what happens is that their partner chews it off. Um, they bite it off, and we invented the word, which is now in the scientific literature, which is called apophily, which means, apophily now, which means cutting off the penis. And of course, under those circumstances, it's great, because if you bite off your partner's penis, A, um, she, as she now is, can no longer fertilise you, and B, she is now forced to accept sperm from you. So that too, strangely enough, has a rather unexpected, perhaps, um, um, uh, um, effect, because this, is, this isn't quite castrating your opponent, but it's effectively the same. You're making your opponent's maleness um, non-functional. Now that too, we can find an echo in the world of art. Here we have one of the black paintings of Goya, you know, painted late in his life, these horrible paintings painted on a black wall. Um, and this is Kronos devouring his children, okay? A horrible picture. And Kronos actually castrated his father, Uranus, okay? Um, now, uh, who, who, who was the daughter of Uranus? Well, the daughter of Uranus was, in fact, Aphrodite. And there's Botticelli, sorry, with Venus, Venus and Aphrodite. There's, a, there's Venus emerging from the foam and a shell, a snail shell, at least a mollusk shell, okay, um, a scallop shell there. There you see the foam. What is the foam? Well, actually, that's what, what, uh, what um, when Uranus was castrated, uh, his uh, Kronos threw Uranus' genitals into the sea, and the material which uh, emerged became the sea. So that isn't really foam at all. It's something quite different. So that's actually, uh, that's actually another unexpected tie, perhaps, of an overlap between biology and, uh, and, uh, and, and art. Now, there are other aspects of snail biology which actually begin to talk a bit more precisely about what I'm going to talk about in the scientific part of this talk. Lots and lots of snails are seen as an image, uh, images of death. And in some places, in Wales, for example, West Wales, where I come from, um, you often see pictures of snails on gravestones. Well, that might seem an odd thing, but the reason behind it is that actually they're um, uh, seen as an image of resurrection. Because what happens in some snails, this is a southern European snail called Theba. You, if you've been in southern Europe in, in the summer, you've almost certainly seen them. What they do is they climb way up above the ground. They seem to be dead. 
And yet when the rains come, they are re- re- resurrected and reborn. Okay? Um, and that's why you get this tie between death and snails, because death snails are also an image of the resurrection. And that actually ties rather closely, as I say, to my, uh, to my, um, to my own scientific interest. Because the reason they do this is not to give us a theological lesson. It, they do it in the summer to get away from the heat. And actually, it's a well-known fact in ecology that the hottest part of any environment is on the ground. Um, if, that, if, you put, if you sit, even on a, Brit- on a British hot summer's day, um, on, on a black <coughs> park bench, you will get up pretty damn smart if you're wearing shorts because dark things heat up more and the lower they are, the, the more they heat up because there's no wind and that kind of stuff down there. So the way to get away from that is to climb and to escape from the superheated air. And that's um, true in humans too. Here we... Um, oh, no, how the hell did that I'm out of, out of order here. I'll, I'll, okay. That's true in humans too, as we'll see. There are other things which overlap between, um, between the snails and humans. Um, it turns out that snails are often eaten by various creatures, birds, thrushes most of all, and some of you may know, it gets into the school books, it's not really entirely true um, that the, uh, the, the, the colours of the shells act as a camouflage, so that in uh, woodlands, the relatively well-hidden ones, the ones which are, uh, are, are reddish and brownish, are uh, uh, favoured. In grasslands, the, the alternative kinds, which are rather stripier and, uh, and perhaps ye- yellowish green in colour, um, are also uh, are favoured the other way. As we, say, as we often say when we're out in the field collecting snails, we pick them up, and there are only two snail jokes. We pick one of them up and we say, this one's got shell shock. <laughs> And then the person you say it to has to say, yes, it comes from a broken home. Um, okay. But that's certainly true. And there's some truth in that camouflage story. And, of course, that gives me an excuse to give you some camouflage uh, art. And we actually know a lot now about the sensory perception of camouflage. Um, it turns out that what it needs to do is to match the graininess of the background. So if you look at a military um, camouflage in a forest uh, where there's lots of patches of, gr- of brown, and gr- brown and green and grey, um, you will see the patches are very small. In a desert where you have patches of different sand colours, the patches are much bigger, and that's what counts. So we've, done, we've actually done quite a lot of work on that with snails. And you can see that in, um, in, uh, in, in art. There's a famous Wandsworth painting from the, from the First World War of a dazzle ship, and dazzle ships were painted with these black and white lines to break up their profile on the same scale as the breaking waves around them. Um, and that's common in zebras, common in, uh, in toads and frogs and that kind of stuff. Uh, famously, Bridget Riley uses that uh, very effectively in her art, and you'll see it different bits of Bridget Riley's art, high dazzle in some places, high grains in others. So that's a kind of uh, another aspect. But the aspect I really want to talk about is this species here. This is the snail I work on, which is on the front cover of my book. Uh, uh, we call it Sapir, Sapir nemoralis. It's, uh, that's its technical name. And the thing which is striking about it is that it's tremendously variable uh, from one individual to the other and from, ne- from one different place to the next place over many different scales. And that's actually why I work on it. On it. And really when I started working on this thing, I hate to th- I hate to admit this, but I'm working on it. I've been working on it for more than 50 years. And if you put yourself back into the prehistory of my field, which is genetics, um, then you, there was almost nothing you could work on. Genetics is the study of differences. That's what genetics is. If everybody was the same, if every creature was the same, there would be no genetics um, and there would be no evolution. Uh, differences, genetic differences, are the raw material of evolution. If they didn't exist, then we'd still all be in the primeval slime. Okay? There could have been no evolutionary advance at all. And in my day, in my day, in the 1960s, when I was a student in Edinburgh, there were really very few creatures in which you could go out and look at differences, count the numbers of genetic di- um, variants within a population and from place to place. This was one of the very few in which you could do it. And if you look at these creatures, you'll see some of them are light-coloured, some of them very dark coloured, some they come in pink and yellow, and they're very and different numbers of stripes on them, several on that, just one on that one. And we bred all these up, and these are under straightforward genetic control. And there are thousands and thousands of possible different kinds. Okay? Um, this is a sample collected, um, in, in fact, in Poland, um, uh, by part of this operation called Evolution Megalam, which I won't talk about particularly now. But they're tremendously variable. Now, of course, now everything has changed. 
um, after I started working on these things, in fact, in 1966 it was, um, uh, people began for the first time to look at human differences, not just the boring ones like skin colour, which are a tiny proportion of the total differences, but in those days, first of all, looking at differences in the proteins in your blood. And it was a great surprise to everybody, and astonishing really, uh, to find that if you looked at the differences in proteins or stuff that genes make, um, everybody is different from everybody else. Now, of course, we can go much further and we can look at differences in DNA. And the differences in DNA are completely spectacular. Here we've got a length of DNA. As I always say to the students, get this down, it's going to be in the exam. Um, <coughs> with the various letters of DNA, G, A, T, C, arranged and sequenced from one, end, from one end to another. And, of course, we can read this stuff off now at an astonishing rate. It took... There are 3,000 million letters in everybody's DNA code, and we can read it now in about two or three hours for about $1,000. Now, given that it cost, took 15 years to do the first job at the cost of many millions of dollars, that's an astonishing rate of progress. And there's a lot of DNA about. Every cell of your body has got two meters of DNA in it. Which means that if any one of you, um, paralyzed by boredom at this talk, and I really wouldn't blame you, um, was to leap screaming out of the room and, and, and cross from that deadly roundabout um, to escape from the Museum of London and be hit by a speeding bus, the DNA in your body would stretch from the damp spot on the pavement, which had, was once you, to the moon and back 8,000 times. So there's a huge amount of DNA there. Okay. And we can read it from end to end, and it turns out that on the average, about one site in a thousand along these 3,000 million DNA sites in every cell can vary from person to person. There are just two of them here. Uh, you'll see there's an A or a C, and line number eight, whatever it is, and at the bottom you can have a T, an A or a G. And there are about three million of these which can happen. And they're, it's like a hand of cards. It can be reshuffled every generation by, uh, that's what sex is. Sex is recombination, reshuffling the order of DNA. And that means that everybody in this room is different from everybody else in this room, of course, unless you're identical twins. And as it happens, my mother was an identical twin, although I don't think that's why I became a biology and geneticist. Um, you're different from everybody on Earth. You're different from everybody who has ever lived. You're different from everybody who ever will live. And even more remarkably, every sperm and every egg ever made is different from all the others. So there's a huge amount of genetic variation there. And to put it frankly, we simply don't know why it's there. Some of it, we can pick it up because it causes diseases. Um, some of it apparently makes you gay, apparently. Um, um, so that at least so the Daily Mail would have us believe. Uh, but most of it, we just don't know why it's there. Um, and that's why we started looking at this snail stuff. We looked at these snails because it was said that this variation in the, in the colour of the shell and so on couldn't be important. Who cares what colour... What, why should a snail care what colour its shell is? What difference does it make? It's what we call neutral variation. And you get exactly that same argument now when you're talking to people who study DNA. They say, oh, it's just random noise. It just comes in, then it goes out again, and it's not important. They're not interested in it. I'm pretty sure they're wrong, and for reasons I hope we can talk about in a, in a little bit in the future. So that's the snail. That's the variation. Um, and it varies not just from individual to individual, but from place to place, as indeed we do. We vary from, pla place, from place to place, of course, in skin colour. We all know that. But you may not know that we vary from place to place in the ability to, to, uh, to cope with alcohol. Those black spots are places where up to 80% of the population are finding biologically impossible to drink alcohol. If they do, um, in China, among Chinese people, for example, um, I'm sure... None of you have ever done this, but when you were 15 or 16 and you had your first bottle of Strongbow Cider, uh, there was that moment of hilarity and joy, uh, which we, of course, all been trying to recapture ever since. Um, and you first you had the first buzz of this stuff, and then suddenly you felt terrible. You began to sweat and shake. Your face went red, and you may have thrown up. Okay, I certainly did. I'm not ashamed to admit it. Um, but And that's what these people who can't digest alcohol, they, they have that every time. They, don't, they lack the enzyme which breaks down alcohol. And this varies in frequency from effectively um, zero, everybody in Glasgow can break down alcohol, <laughs> to almost 100% in parts of China, and conveniently, of course, 
in parts of the Islamic world. Uh, why, that, why that is, we don't really know, but it's a statement of these differences from place to place happen in humans, and they do certainly happen in snails. Well, as I said, what happens in snails is, if you, if you look at snails, what they have a difference is in whether they're dark or whether they're light. So these are kind of extremes. Um, and in fact, if you draw a map of the frequency, the abundance of the dark and the light kinds, um, from the north to the south of Europe, and this is based on several hundred thousand snails which I've collected over the years, uh, there's a striking tendency for the relatively light-coloured individuals to be common down in hot places and the relatively dark, pinkish-coloured individuals to be common in cold places up in the north. And if you draw a diagram of the fit between the incidence of the light-coloured, one of the light-coloured variants, the yellow shell colour, uh, and mean summer temperature, it's absolutely a linear fit. Um, and that makes sense because, as it's talking about that black iron park bench again, if you, uh, if, you, if you sit on a black park bench on a sunny day, you get a lot hotter than if you sit on a white park bench. Dark objects heat up much more in the sun, so it would make more sense, or so it seems, to have relatively dark-coloured objects in the north and light-coloured objects, snails, in the south. And it's worth reminding ourselves how much we all live on what's sometimes called a thermal cliff. We all have a... Because I'm a thermal biologist, I can't think in centigrade, so uh, I'll, I'll think in, in Fahrenheit. We all have a body temperature of about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. If you go five degrees above that or five degrees below that, you're dead. Okay? It's, uh, it's, it's very, very tightly controlled. And we spend an enormous amount of our... Um, efforts in keeping that temperature right. I notice almost everybody in this room, for example, is wearing clothes. Uh, that has a lot to do with it. Okay? This room is being heated, um, for, and that too has a lot to do with it. In fact, something like 60% of your total income is spent on keeping warm in the, in the widest sense. And by that, I mean including eating lots of, uh, lots of uh, food uh, to burn it to keep your body warm. Now, snails and insects and so on can't do that. They can't keep warm by virtue of their own internal furnaces. They can only keep warm by heating up or, or being heated up or, or hiding in the shade, being heated up by the sun or hiding in the shade. They're what we call ectotherms. And they live on this thermal cliff. They have to spend their time constantly aware that they're in danger either of overheating and dying of thermal shock, or of not being warm enough and not being able to find food, find a mate, and that kind of stuff. So it's really important to them to keep their temperature within a surprisingly narrow range by the way they behave. And that makes sense in the, um, in the context of this dark forms common in the north and the like. Now, in fact, we too do the same thing. Some of you may have seen that Tate Modern piece, rather dramatic, really, um, which uh, was, must be three or four years ago now. Um, where are we here? Okay. The, uh, the, I forgot the name of the artist. Eliasson was his name? I can't remember. And, of course, it was, called, it was called The Weather Project, and it had this enormous sun at the end of the Tate Modern shining down. It was actually really quite, uh, it was really quite um, impressive. I thought it was much better than the silly helter-skelters which then followed it. Um, and it was interesting to watch people's behaviour because at the bottom, as you can see, people are lying in the sun, looking with amazement at it. And if you want to get tanned, of course, you lie in the sun. But if it's a hot day, you surely don't do that, because you very quickly become deeply uncomfortable, too hot, because you're down um, on the ground. And that's particularly true, actually, for people with black skins compared to white skins. Um, so that's a, the story is the same there. But there's the people in the Tate Modern. And it's now generally accepted that one of the main reasons why we stand upright is, was actually that when we came down from the trees, which was several million years ago, um, when the climate dried and the savannah replaced the forest, we came down from the trees and we immediately faced this problem that if we went on all fours, we constantly, in Africa, you constantly got overheated. And so the, ev the evidence um, is quite strong that actually that's why we became bipedal. And as soon as you become bipedal, you can balance on two feet, um, then all kinds of other things can happen. You can actually w travel much faster, you can run uh, with much more efficiency than, than an ape can, and you can run down animals, even deer, because all of the go fast for a while, they can't keep it up. Um, so this was this behavioural thermoregulation, as it's called, standing up to avoid the heat of the surface, was important even for us. As indeed, you may remember, I just said it was important for that snail fever as well. And it turns out 
that actually exactly that drives an awful lot of the Snell story. Now, this is some experiments we did, rather silly experiments our student of mine did, where we collected snails from Scotland um, in the north and to Spain, to the Pyrenees, which is where I do much of my work, and asked in the laboratory, we made this thing called the molluscatron, and the molluscatron was simply a big plastic pipe. You put them in the bottom and you come back in the morning, and you'd ask how high they climb, and there was an absolutely striking tendency from the ones in the south, the hotter places, to climb um, much more than the ones in the north. So that too suggests that there's been a behavioural shift. Um, there's also another thing you can do, um, which is rather weird. It turns out they've, got, they've evolved in the north and the south different ability to withstand the pain of heat. I was once talking to a colleague of mine about the genetics of pain sensitivity. And there is a lot of genetics of pain sensitivity. It is absolutely the case that people with red hair are much more sensitive to pain than people with dark, with other colours of hair. So uh, that's not just an old wise tale, that's actually true. And this friend of mine worked on the genetics of pain sensitivity in mice, inbred mice, which he crossed different lines to see if he could find the genes. And he's found several genes involved, including hair colour genes. And I said to him, well, how do you measure pain sensitivity in mice? I mean, do you hit them with a hammer or, and see how loud they squeak, you know, an Monty Python kind of way? And he said, oh no, I've got this, you've got this uh, machine here. Um, which is a hot plate. It's not really a hot plate, it's a warm plate. And it's a plate which you can turn the temperature up to about 40 degrees Celsius, um, and you put your mouse on the plate, and mice, for some reason, it's not damaging at all. You can put your hand on it, it's warm. Um, and mice hate having their feet hot. I don't know why. So they're on the plate, and you turn it up, and it suddenly starts doing this. <laughs> okay, to cool down. And the more sensitive they are, the faster they do. Okay. So you can measure the heat sensitivity. Well, in fact, I thought, well, that's really weird, because if you look at snails in southern Europe, um, standing on a rock on a hot day, they'll do this. They'll flip the front, then they'll flip the back. They'll flip the front, and then they'll flip the back. So we started doing that with the snails, and lo and behold, we got exactly the same story. But in the north, in North Wales this time, rather than in um, Scotland, the um, snails were much more sensitive to, to heat, uh, they responded immediately if they were heated up uh, than in the south. And the effect was really quite big. So again, we're building up a story that it's actually thermal relations in sunshine dealing with the heat that comes in from outside, which is driving a lot of their biology. Well, let's get back to the art briefly. You're all familiar, of course, with Dutch flower paintings. And Dutch flower paintings are very beautiful things. And like many paintings of that period, they have a religious message. And the message is an oddly depressing one, which is admire these beautiful, beautiful flowers and then look more carefully. And in all of them, you will find caterpillars and grubs and worms. Um, and the reminder is, however beautiful these flowers are today, they will be dead tomorrow and will be eaten up by worms. Okay? And that's going to happen to you, so repent. That's the message. Okay? Now, this particular one, I rather like because the animals doing the job are snails. In fact, they're clearly mice snail, sapir, and as you can see, here we have one of them, there, blown up. Here we have another one, there, blown up. And they're about to bring their theological message by eating these flowers, okay? But the interesting thing is that actually, if you were to glance at this, um, at this uh, painting, you really probably wouldn't spot the snails. You have to look fairly hard in order to get the message. And that's what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this talk. How do snails deal with living in such a complicated environment as this? This is a very complicated environment, both in terms of the species of flowers that are there, there are several different kinds of flowers, and also what we might call architecturally, the way it's built together. There's all kinds of patches of dark and light and that kind of stuff. It's a very beautiful thing, but it's also, as I say, um, has, it's quite a metaphor for the way that snails actually do live. Now, I have a good general rule. Um, which you should never work on any creature that, do that doesn't live in national parks. And my snails appear, and I've spent many years down there, uh, reaches its enormous abundance in the Pyrenees. And the Pyrenees is the snail capital of Europe. They're everywhere, these things. And it's a remarkably interesting and dramatic place. Being, I first went there 50 years ago. It's been considerably ruined by motorways and skis now, but uh, certainly a lot of it is still utterly magnificent. And the snails live all over the place. They live from sea level, basically, on the west end anyway, uh, right the way up to about 2,600 metres, so they've got an enormous range. And you can, what you can do 
is, what you should be able to do is make the thing work. Work, you bastard. Right. Funny how these things always don't work. No, I'll do it another way. Okay. Um, here we have the place I work in called the Val d'Aran. And the Val d'Aran, it's actually in Spain, but it's on the north side of the range. Okay? It's a little enclave, enclave in, in, the, in the Pyrenees. They did actually have a revolution in 1945 to try and break away from Franco, but Franco sent in his troops and put a stop to that. Um, and the Val d'Aran is a dramatic kind of place. Snails everywhere. And you get snails, for example, commonly in this kind of habitat here, which is not as beautiful as that base of flowers, but it's the same kind of architecturally and botanically maybe complicated habitat. So there are plenty, plenty of snails there. Then you can go up, then you can, this thing has really died on me. Then you can go up, whoops, then you can go up to the top and uh, you'll find snails there. And there you'll find them all over this grass, okay, which is, at first sight, a much, much simpler kind of habitat. And if you plot out the abundance of the different kinds of snail in different places, what you find is that the relatively dark ones are down in the, down in the bottoms and the relatively light ones are up more common up at the top. Okay? And there are many, many thousands of snails in this uh, diagram, but it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty consistent. Um, and up at the top, if you go up the top, if any of you ever ski, which I never do, which seems to be utterly pointless pastime, but still, you will know that if you ski or if you go walking in the mountains on a sunny day, you will get severely sunburned. Because if you're a long way up, there's much more ultraviolet, much more energy coming, out, coming in. So that's where the real thermal stress is, up there. The air temperature may be relatively cold, but the solar energy is far, far greater. So for a snail, it's a pretty challenging kind of environment. So the question arose, okay, how do the snails cope with this? And the interesting question is not the fact, which is certainly true, that you, uh, that you get dark snails in Scotland and dark snails down in the valleys here, um, and light snails in Spain and light snails up at the tops of the valleys here. Uh, the more interesting question is that almost everywhere, whatever you are, in Montrose, which is where I did my first work in 1965, where the sun never shines, or down in the south here, where the sun shines most of the time, whatever you are, in nearly all these snail populations, even though they're 90% dark coloured in Montrose and 90% light coloured down here, you nearly always get some of the other forms. And that's really weird. I mean, why do they stay variable? Why doesn't one form just take over as light skin took over in Europe when we left Africa, for example? Um, and that's the interesting question. Uh, you can certainly find that the uh, relative abundance of these forms varies from place to place, but why do you still have diversity? And that's what we started looking at and with... Um, with some success, I flatter myself. Now, if you go to that first place, down at the bottom, very complicated architectural place, this is the sample that comes from there, and there's both kinds of animal, animal are there, dark ones and light ones. Up at the top, this is a picture I took uh, on Kodachrome film a long time ago, uh, nearly all the animals are light coloured. Okay. So we began to ask, Okay, what's going on? What is making this difference? Why, are we, how do we do, why do we have this difference? And why do we retain both kinds? And the first question was to say, first uh, observation was, if you look at, the, at a hedgerow or a nettle patch down in the um, valley, that's obviously much more botanically diverse than an alpine meadow up at the top, as I thought naively. But that isn't true at all. We, we'd captured a botanist and took her with us, um, and we should have known this. Anyway, in fact, the most diverse in terms of different numbers of species of plants kind of habitat is an alpine meadow. If you go there in the spring, you see these thousands of different kinds of flowers. So that these meadows are actually much more uh, biologically variable in the uh, numbers of species of plant they've got than down in the valley. So that didn't work. But in some sense, it was clear that they were less variable. We'd know, we knew that, it had, that snails and sunshine had a lot to do with each other. So we began to look at that. The question was, okay, how much does the, su the sun penetrate these different kinds of habitats? Now, this is a field that's called sun fleck ecology. And it may seem rather silly, but in fact it's not. It's really very important because what determines how fast crops grow, grow is, among other things, is how much sun gets into them. And a huge amount of quite sophisticated research, is done on the optimal planting distance of one maize plant from another, how tall should the maize plant be, um, that kind of thing. So we know a lot about it. And you can buy enormously expensive machines, um, and they can be done by satellites too, which tell you what, how much uh, 
uh, light is going to get into a crop and how much is going to be broken up into sun flecks as it goes in. Well, I was working on a British research grant, so we didn't have any money at all. Um, so we decided under those circumstances that we had to start thinking about it. And I invented this technique, which rather regrettably has picked up the name of Jones's balls. And here are Jones's balls here. <laughs> And the argument was, well, let's think like a snail, all right? Which I've been doing for some years now. And the argument is a snail is sitting there and um, maybe exposed to lots and lots of sunlight. And the logic was to take some snail-sized um, polystyrene spheres and chuck them in. Then we chuck them in there and define oneself as being the sun, the Le Roi Soleil. And we didn't have a satellite, but we did have a stepladder. And the argument was to go to the point where the sun comes up um, in the east on June the 21st and to climb up the stepladder and climb down the other side of the stepladder, counting the number of balls you could see um, at different times of day. Dawn, uh, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and all the way around to, till the sun goes down. And in a place like this, even if you, um, uh, even if you started at dawn looking at, the, at ground level, uh, noon you'd be looking from the top, you would see quite a lot of balls, uh, uh, quite a number of these spheres um, uh, at, uh, at each position. But in a, place like, in a place like this, you would see fewer, and in a place like that, you would see fewer still. So it looked as if there was some fit between the extent to which these uh, artificial plastic snails were hidden um, by the vegetation and the amount uh, of, of sun which they might actually experience. Um, now, you can take a snail's eye view, and this is a picture taken with a, what's called a fish eye camera. Okay, and a fish eye camera, as you probably know, has got this big lens you put at the bottom of a wood or the bottom of a hedgerow, and you take a picture through it, and you can use a computer to work out the patches of dark and light. How patchy is it? Well, we didn't have a fish eye camera. We took this off the internet, and it would be too difficult and expensive to do, so we thought of something else. And this is what we thought of. Um, this was an attempt to measure the amount of sunlight which falls upon particular individual um, plastic balls or particular individual leaves or particular individual snails during the course of a day, a week, a month. And um, it turned on the observation, which would have been very easy to make in the 1960s, which was that everybody who was anybody wore jeans, OK? And if you wanted to show what an extraordinarily sophisticated and hip individual you were, you wore faded jeans. You've got jeans which faded in sunlight. And I was up in the Pyrenees one day and I thought, that's a good idea, we'll do some gene manipulation. A weak joke, but it's what we did. Um, we got some, some denim jeans, cut out little squares and stuck them onto snails. The argument being that if they were out in the sun, they would fade more, and uh, if they were not, they wouldn't fade. Well, that didn't work. They quickly lost their genes. Their genes fell off. Um, but actually, then we went, I went a step further, and I thought, well, why don't we just find out what the name of the blue dye is? It's actually called Kumasi blue. Um, inside, in these genes, what do they fade them with? What do they, what do they dye them with? It fades in the sun. That's the, we took the blue dye, bought some of it, um, and mixed it with a stable yellow paint actually used to spray cars. And if you put blue, blue and yellow together, what you get, you get green. And if you put the green paint onto a snail or onto a plastic ball or onto a leaf, it fades and it works. It works, to my surprise, remarkably well. Um, here's one of the things we did. This is called a spider. Uh, it's called a spider because it's a little disc which you, with uh, some little wires attached to it, which you can replace those balls we just saw. We can wire this disc there where, where the balls fell, and we can ask how much variation is there in a particular place. And the answer is, as you can see, that when there's a lot of variation in the fading of those, of, those, um, of those spiders, some of them will be deep in the vegetation, some of them will be up at the top, then there is more variation in the snail population. The more variation there is in the snails um, fits on the amount of variation there is in the fading score. Okay? So that was nice, but we needed to go one step further. We needed, of course, to ask the snails themselves. And here we have a picture of two snails, um, one of which has has chosen, that's the word, not to go out in the sun very much. This guy here, as you can see, has still got dark green. This guy here, from the same place, has spent more time in the sun. Okay? And now we marked thousands of these snails. We used to do it, we did it in the wild, but that turned out to be problematic. So we set up this thing here, which is the University College London Snail Ranch, which is at Whiteham Hill. It was at Whiteham Hill 
near Oxford. Have you ever been up there? Oxford, that's uh, one of the older provincial universities. Um, that's got this enormous estate, Whiteham Estate, beautiful place, um, and a huge uh, field in the middle of it. And we put up 100 cages. And these, are, these are the 100 cages. It took a hell of a lot of time to make them. That's them. They're a meter across, 10 of them that way, 10 of them that way. And this is uh, somebody flew over it and took this picture. Um, and uh, we used those in these experiments. And what we did was to take snails, dark and light ones, and put them in the cages and ask the question, is it the case that within a particular population, the dark and the light ones choose to live in different parts of the habitat and choose to experience different amounts of sunlight? And very gratifyingly, the answer was yes, that the dark ones tended to spend more time in sunlight and the light ones, a lot more time exposed to sun than the light ones, uh, and the light ones tended to spend less time exposed to the sun. And we did this again and again, and we've done many modifications of the experiment, um, and the effect is really quite striking. So what the animals are doing are choosing to live in different parts of this bush over a period of a month or so. Now, you could never see that by simply looking at them, because they never do anything interesting. They just sit there and waggle their tentacles now and again, uh, <clears throat> and go in for a bit of furtive sex. Um, but if you can mark them, you can add up the number of hours they spent in the sun over, over a month or so. And that's what we did. We then did the obvious uh, second experiment, which is to take some dark ones and paint them white, and some white ones and paint them black, uh, and light ones and paint them black. So we reversed them, what you might call phonetic rather than genetic engineering, um, and lo and behold, they changed their behavior. The uh, ones which had tended to uh, hide away because they were relatively light coloured. When we painted them with black paint, they tended to come out more. Okay? So that was, I thought, rather cunning. And I could talk a lot more about that experiment and those experiments. But I think it's an ingenious, rather, in, oh, I say it myself, it's a rather ingenious technique, which has not, never really been picked up. I did an experiment once with a, I was working in Botswana, no, in South Africa, I was there, uh, with, a, with a friend of mine. Um, at uh, in Baragunath Hospital in, in, in uh, Joburg. It's a rather frightening place because people keep coming in with terrible wounds. But in South Africa, um, and in West Africa too, quite surprisingly, there's a relatively high incidence of albinism among some African populations, Africans who have no melanin in their skin. And that's really quite problematic because they nearly all get they nearly all used to get skin cancer. Um, and uh, so what they had to be told when they were kids was to be absolutely sure not to go out in the sun and always wear these hats and that kind of stuff. And uh, this is slightly off, off, off the beat, but it shows how this stuff could be used. And I said to my friend, uh, uh, Tommy Jenkins, uh, I said, I thought what we can do, we can give them hats which have been soaked in this fading paint. And then we can tell how much time they spent in the sun and how much time they've gone in. Um, didn't work because they wanted to help us, so they left the hats out in the sun, and that didn't work. <laughs> but still, I think, it could be, I think it could be more widely used. But that's the take-home lesson, really, that actually it's the nature of science. What, what succeeds in science is taking totally different fields and putting them together. And in some ways, I think that's also the nature of art. That's what the nature of art is, taking totally different media, totally different ideas, and bringing them into a harmonious whole. That's much more, perhaps, the nature of modern art than of, uh, of the, the art of the Middle Ages, but that's really what it is. So science and art, in that sense, have got quite a lot to do with each other. Um, now, when I was talking, I was talking to somebody once um, whose name was, what was his name? Uh, Finley Taylor. And he was talking to me. In fact, he called me up. He's an artist. Uh, he's a, and uh, he called me up and said, you work on snails. He said, I want to make an artwork based on snails. And I said, really? An artwork based on snails? Said, you know, Matisse has done it. He says, no, no, I want to do it something more subtle than that. So the idea was, after some discussion, that this would be his artwork. He would take a copy, not the first edition, because that's worth a huge amount of money, but a 19th century copy of The Origin of Species by Darwin, um, and a copy of one of my books, which is called Almost Like a Whale, which is an attempt to update and rewrite the origin of species um, as if it were being written today, or in 1999 when I wrote this book. And he put them both in his garden, which was infested by snails, um, and uh, ask which ones did they prefer to eat. Um, and here's the results. It turned out that the mollusks much prefer to eat Darwin compared to Jones, so that as well as being beautiful, that proves that they too have got good taste. So I'll stop there. Thank you.